uh, meeting one of the uh, members of a church in Plymouth that he knew, uh, just because he suddenly realised that God may actually be interested in his situation. So, uh, fantastic. There we go. But that's my one big thank you for you. So, all glory to God. But wonderful. We just don't know, do we, as guys said and uh, others have shared. But I am... I'm not going to talk for two. Oh, I don't know. The trouble is, if people give me the chance to talk, I do tend to. So apologies. Um, I, I thought actually I would talk about something I have never, ever, ever spoken about before. And it's because Frank and Barry gave me a little brief that said, uh, can you talk about uh, the workplace being a place of recognising purpose and people and people coming before profit and also how young people, particularly or people in our care or under our leadership, can achieve their potential. And um, it took me back just when I was thinking about it to uh, my one appearance on, on national TV. And I, I've never told this story because there's, there's quite a lot of personal pain that came from it. But I thought, well, okay, I don't, I don't have to look you in the eyes, humanly speaking, in the flesh. So I'll just tell you this story. And if you hang up, then, then, uh, then I don't have to worry about the consequences. But I thought it might be helpful just to set the scene. The, the story is, and I, I've, I've found online actually yesterday, the um, the BBC uh, blurb about when they promoted the programme, which was the money programme. And uh, it was on Wednesday, the 5th of June, 2002 at 7.30 p.m. And I'll, I'll read you the blurb that they, they promoted the programme on, then I'll tell you the story and, and why it's got relevance, I hope, for today. Uh, they titled the programme, The Motivators, and it, they, their blurb was this, British companies are now investing millions in motivational courses for their staff using ever more radical techniques from hostage rescue with the SAS to timeline therapy, motivation is big business, but does it work? Is this unregulated industry the answer to all our management problems or is it a waste of money? Is it motivation or manipulation? The money program follows three household name companies with three very different approaches. Purple Loans, a subsidiary of the giant GE Capital is one of the country's largest consumer finance brokers. To address the problem of their staff motivation, they send their middle managers to be trained in hostage rescue by a group of ex-SAS soldiers. Elsewhere in the world of finance, they adopt for a more psychological approach. Top Barclays bank executive, uh, Paul Morris, is sent on a course of timeline therapy, which delves deep into his childhood to discover and reprogram his deep-seated fear of exclusion. Barclays believe this will make him a better manager. Paul has just been promoted to UK Director of Savings and Investments at just 36 years old. He's already number four in the country and they're grooming him for the top. His performance is crucial. So Bartley's are sending him on an intense program of executive coaching. A person's behavior today is very much influenced by the experiences they've had in their past life. A lot of those experiences which influence their behavior are in their subconscious. You, you know, so you know we don't remember everything. So if we want a person to change, we need to bring those experiences that affect their behavior today into that consciousness. So that was the blurb. And, and the story of the program was uh, I, I underwent um, nine pretty much full day sessions with a guy called David Ross, who actually was a Christian. And um, the program chose not to anchor themselves in the fact that really we were discussing um, who God made us to be and the things that took us away from that design if you like and um and focused instead on the kind of journey of understanding the things that influenced me and uh, and made me who i was for good and not so good and um particularly um they landed on a phrase that i had i'm oh, sorry i should put a, a kind of health warning around this the, the program made me sign a disclosure which i didn't think anything of at the time which meant that i never saw any of the drafting or the content or had any awareness of what they were going to pull out of this filming of nine hours of me with david and um which seemed fine at the time until the morning so i was in charge of an office of about four or five hundred people in the retail bank up in coventry and the papers arrived on the morning and my pa Anne picked them up and she said oh let's have a look at the um, previews for the tv tonight for this is the, the day of the program going out and there was one, I think it was the mail. No, no, I'll buy one um, this morning. Mail. It was um, <laughs> Chris and the mail. And um, what on, on um, just wait, that's going to be. The mail, um, the mail wrote something along the lines of <laughs> Paul <laughs> Morrish, whose, sole, whose main objective in life in his career is to be not like his dad. 
and I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? Because uh, obviously I knew that around Exeter and elsewhere, my whole family would be watching this program. And in fact, my mum and dad, I think, had a load of friends around to watch it. So I went into panic mode. And that meant I didn't say anything to anyone and thought, hopefully the program will air and not cause us a lot of grief. And uh, I, interesting, I found a transcript of the program online also yesterday when I was looking. And it said to me, uh, the phrase that they anchored a lot of my feedback on was this, which I don't necessarily quote with any need to be sensational. It said, the biggest side of my dad's, the biggest side of my dad uh, that's a role model to me is all the things that he isn't. And uh, I had a very challenging relationship with my dad because he didn't give me a lot of his love and he didn't give me a lot of his time. And I think I recognized that, that through that whole experience that um, actually giving time, giving who you are, was the big thing I took out of being a part of the money program because we all have something to give to others that allows them to be more of who God has made them to be. And uh, for me, a lot of the fact that what I had, hadn't had had in my early part of my life was drove a lot of the behaviours that the, the programme focused on, which was my desire to be included, my desire to be involved, my desire to try and make a difference, because I was looking for affirmation. And uh, to a certain extent, it's been a part of, I think, my life all the way through. It's just I've had a better awareness of some of the downsides and the upsides that go with it. But I wanted to share that with you because in many ways, digging deep into the things that influenced who I was and why that was the case and how God as my father saw me in that context as you know not necessarily the same as uh, all those experiences were designed to make me be massively influences and influence has influenced and does influence the way I see people around us as leaders in the workplace etc cetera, etc cetera. and and I came across something as I grew my body or my body's career grew that totally changed me in terms of my view of leadership and uh, and how God calls us and places us into an environment where he may ask us to make a contribution that doesn't necessarily turn us into the people who just walk by on the other side of the street when we see things that are unfulfilled by way of potential. And that was a concept that I um, we were trained in in Bartley. So it was called the employee service profit chain. And I, it, when I'm doing leadership development stuff or when I'm doing uh, anything actually where someone says come in and do a consultancy review of your business or whatever, and indeed the way we've built our own financial advice business, I always, always, always anchor it in this, which I would commend to you wholly. I think it's very, very commensurate with the way God would see us as humans, as his children, making a difference in business. Uh, or, and in life, in any situation where we leadership, it, you can Google it. It's a Harvard case study review. If you want to drop me an email, I've got several copies of different versions of it. The basic philosophy, though, is this, which is our biggest resource, if you like, in, in anything we do is people. And so if we look after our people, they will respond and do the utmost based on what they have available to them, their gifting, if you like, to deliver better outcomes. So our role as leaders is all about unlocking the potential of the person. So in the context of a business, you look after the employee, they will deliver great service. Great service will, in the end, deliver great profit. And it's a chain because you have to deliver some of that profit back to the employee by way of their reward. And, and this all started in a, an airline in America called Southwest Airlines, where the, the cutthroat US inside America uh, kind of airline industry where it's very difficult to make profit because it's just, you know, short flights, lots of volume. They, but it's also hard to keep employees and keep them motivated. So what they did, and they took it to a whole new level, was they even said in their annual reviews, for example, employees are not reviewed by their bosses. They are only given a bonus based on what their employees tell them or tell in their review, they feel of them as a boss. And so it's nothing at all to do with, did you do what we told you? It's all to do with, did you help me be who I could be in the context of this workplace, the employee service profit chain? And I, I, my own belief is that there's a whole heap of stuff in there for us as, as leaders, uh, whether in a workplace or in a different context, which are about um, us seeing people the way Jesus did and does. If you like, how we see people uh, made in their father's image. And uh, I've been engaged a little bit recently with something I'd never come across before with a, with a couple who actually are at a church in Bristol, a guy will know, in fact, I think it's Guy's church. Um, uh, 
on the context on the concept of what's called original design, who we were the day God brought us into being. Uh, on the basis that the world around us, if you like, twists it and turns it into something that it was never supposed to be. What is it that turns our characters into slightly selfish individuals or some of our agendas to be actually not those which are glorifying to God, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what is it, what were we really made to be and how should that manifest itself in our, in our actions and our reactions to those around us? And I just thought I'd kind of bang out some of the things that for me that, brings us to a place of having to confront questions such as how active are we around questions and actions to do with inclusion? Uh, how, how, how open are we with those we are responsible for? How, how inclusive are we with our own thoughts, our own failings, our own uh, challenges, actually, our own decision making? Or do we treat it as it's mine, so I will make that decision? Um, how much do we seek the opinions of others? How much do we act without bias in the sense of how much do we include others in our own processes and our own thoughts and value them accordingly? It's hit a bit of an interesting moment for me this year um, as, it, as that perhaps takes itself into a slightly different dimension around the question of inequality. So am I completely equal in my treatment and my attitude towards others or do I have hidden biases? You know, maybe I think someone is not quite so eloquent or someone is not quite so adept or I trust someone more than I trust others. Um, and does that come over in situations when I'm dealing with, with people in a workplace or outside of it? And, and I, the illustration I've had, uh, and, I, and I know God has given me this for my own season that I'm in at the moment, but I'll share it with you. And if it lands well, then uh, great is the cricketer Joffre Archer um, this year has had a very, very interesting year. So apologies if that means nothing to you, if you have no idea who Joffre Archer is. Joffre Archer is this uh, young, incredibly talented, fast bowler. Every cricket team wants a brilliant fast bowler who causes havoc and disruption. But at the beginning of this year, he had to stop playing cricket for a while because he had problems with his hands, which obviously when you're a cricketer and you're a bowler is a particularly difficult injury to have. And they prescribed rest for him uh, as, as the route to recovery. So he could be back to his brilliant best, if you like, the way he was made to be. But he came back and it didn't sort it out. So they then uh, opened up and operated on uh, some of the tendons in his fingers. And again, it didn't quite work. And then they discovered what the real problem was with Joffre Archer, which was he was moving a fish tank in his house and it broke and some microscopic shards of glass got stuck inside some of the tendons of his fingers. It, it's a bit like, uh, if you think about uh, the, the kind of thorn in the flesh type idea in the Bible, but he couldn't be the brilliant fast bowler he wanted to be uh, because he had these very small shards of glass that they only found when they went deep into surgery and if you like x-rayed and found what the real problem was that was stopping him being the brilliant man he was. And, and this year I've been trotting around in my, in my commentary to others talking about, do we understand what the shards of glass are in, in the lives of those around us, the employees, those for whom we would want to help unlock the potential, and perhaps more relevantly, pointing the finger back at ourselves, what are they in our own lives? You know, so I, I've had to come all the way back, which is probably why I ended up going back and looking at the money program thing about this desire for affirmation, this desire for inclusion as being in some senses, parts of my shards of glass and, and, and probably they're handicapping some aspect of me being totally focused on equality and totally not having bias in the way I view the inputs of others. And so from that point of view, I, I would just, you know, I wanted to show you perhaps more than, more than uh, anything else this morning, a, a word that I think has got lost in our language, which is the question of whether or not we are nurturers. Uh, I am very uh, challenged by Matthew 9.36, which says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And I think compassion in a workplace sense is an awful lot to do with our attitude and whether we see ourselves as nurturers. Because if we are not a nurturer, we are a taker. We're an abuser. We are a, we're a selfish individual trying to manipulate things for our own ends in the extreme, I accept. And I think the role of leadership, particularly in a workplace context, but it's far from just in a workplace context, is about nurturing that which we are given, to whom much is given, much is expected. 
but it seems to have become a concept that's gone alien somewhere because we want everything today. We want a quick result. We want the most profitable pathway to the quickest outcome or whatever it is. And I think we've lost the, the humanity, the Christ-like calling of being a nurturer. And, and that was the word I most wanted to bring to you this morning. Um, but to also put a context to that before I shut up. And uh, that was to say that I think, you know, we all have the opportunity to be an influencer. You know, we, we can be an influencer that is a nurturer uh, because everyone has a purpose. And if we see that everyone in our care or our payroll has, uh, has God-given potential, then we see surely it is our opportunity our calling to see that our part of our responsibility as a nurturer is to unlock the influence of others, the ability to be who God has made them to be. And I, I see it massively in, in the stuff I, I suppose I spend more time doing these days as I do less actual work uh, around, for example, the need to nurture and coach and encourage and call out the gold in the young, you know, the earlier we get into that type of relationship, that's what parenting's about, isn't it? With young people, the less the kind of bad stuff that in many ways my work money program experience was trying to address has a chance to build up and clog us up. The, the, the less long the shards are in your hand, if you like. And I think, you know, in, in today's broken home world where fathers are missing and mothers are missing and role models are absent, the more we get into a mindset that we have a gift given to us in the workplace or elsewhere to be an influence, to be a nurturer for people for whom those are not day-to-day -day experiences, the better. Uh, and, I, you know, the context for me is mostly actually to do with, um, with students in my mentoring work. But, you know, students who will, whether for right or for wrong, have an opportunity to create perhaps more uh, leadership influence and more power and more more opportunity from and through themselves is for me quite a big uh, place of serving in that sense because how you influence and nurture and coach call out the gold see the potential knock off the rough edges with students or, or young people or employees who are neither of those things or young adults who are just finding their way in life um, the better uh, and I, I personally, uh, uh, that's tended to be where I focus. I, I was, but I, I've come across one other aspect of that, which probably is more relevant to some of us than others I accept, which is I am hugely interested in older people all of a sudden, probably because I'm getting that way. But I, I've come across Age UK and their men in sheds concept where they, they have a whole load of blokes who are great with practical skills and they're teaching practical skills in their men in sheds to younger adults how to mend stuff, how to not become, you know, a throwaway society. They, they, there's, a, there's a workshop down in St. Thomas, which um, Age UK have. And there's one bloke in there who's apparently teaching a young guy who's had a pretty rough life, he's only 18, how to strip copper out of old cables, you know, be it electricity cables or the things that plug into the back of old radios and all that stuff, because you can make money for charity. 300 quid a year he made last year, this 18 year old and this old bloke who taught him how to strip cables and sell the copper that came out in the middle of the cables for the good of the charity. And I met this kid last week. He was unbelievable. He's just, he, he, I mean, talk about growing up on the rough side of the street. But all he's had is the influence and nurturing of this old bloke who's been doing that and is just giving it to him for the pursuit of something far more than just profit. And I thought it was fantastic, you know, the, the tapping in rather than disposing of older people and what they can be and bring by way of nurturing to young adults. And I think it's a call to us in the workplace, uh, a huge call to us. And it, mostly, I think, because it's just part of leadership, you know. I, I ran a course, I run it every now and then on leading where you are. You know, we all are leaders, aren't we? We just got to recognize where we are and what God is calling us to lead and influence and nurture in that sense. So there we go. Uh, one other thing, if I'm, again, I'm doing it in a spirit of openness, so please treat and respect this accordingly. I um, have been challenged partly because of my own kind of looking at myself in the Joffre Archer way, if you like, around my heart and whether you know we can all use these words and try and do these things quite well but acts 821 i think has a powerful challenge for us which is how are you 
you have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. So that's 28, 21. You know, and I think if our heart is more oriented towards just looking after the people that God has brought into our lives, and we may have them on our payroll, we may have them in a, in a mentor situation, but actually our heart's got to be right towards them and nurturing them to be all that God has called them to be, to, if you like, restore them to their design that God saw it to be in the place they happen to be in our lives right now. And that becomes about honouring, doesn't it, you know, uh, one another. God's gifts as placed in others, and also God's gifts as placed in others for the difference they'll make in, in the future of those individuals and what they'll do for his glory, hopefully. So that's all I had to say, really. I um, I hope it's helpful. It's uh, it's very much uh, a word in my season. Uh, so apologies if it's not quite in yours, but uh, if it is, then uh, it's brilliant. And let's trust that God will do something with it. Can I just pray before I finish and then uh, turn it to question? Father, Lord God, we thank you that you are the ultimate nurturer. You are the ultimate uh, carer, uh, wanting the best for us because the best for us was your design. And I just pray you'll illuminate our hearts and our, our lives and our, and our thoughts and our patterns of activity to, to be you in the situations we have around us, the people you've placed in our care, be it on our payroll or in our church or in our circle of influence. Lord, may we be positive and, and set alight by you through the power of your spirit to bring and release potential that you've placed inside others for your good and for your glory.